you who believe Give charity For the pleasure of Allah The pleasure of Allah Oh, you who believe Read the Quran Every night of Ramadan Night of Ramadan Welcome, oh Ramadan It is Ramadan It is Ramadan Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, part one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakia. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakia, as many of the shows, we've started off with definition of the terms, and this episode will be none different in the sense that I'd like you to first and foremost to define the term, what exactly does Islam mean especially in the context of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala sulillah, wa ala ali wa sahibi ajma'in, amma abad. A'uzu billahi minash shaytanir rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim, rabbi shahli sadri, wa yassalli amri, wa halul uqdata min lisaani yafqahu kawli. The Arabic word isla means to correct, it means to improve, it means to repair. Whenever one Muslim corrects another Muslim, or he improves him, it is called as isla. For example, if a Muslim is making a mistake, whether in offering salah or in any of the acts of Islam or anything, if someone corrects him, it's called as isla. And it's mentioned in the Quran, Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 88. My only desire is your improvement, is your betterment to the best of my power. And my success will only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I trust in him and I look up to him. I trust in Allah and I look up to Allah. So here we realize that Shuaib alayhi salam, he wanted to isla to his people. It's further mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 114. It says that in their secret talks, there is no good, except for a person who desires a good deed of charity, or justice, or reconcilement between two Muslims. If such a deed he does, then secrecy is permissible. And if someone does such a deed, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'll get a reward which is very high. Otherwise, normally, secret talks, most of the time it's not good, except for deeds of charity, of justice, and reconcilement between two Muslims. So here we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that one Muslim should try and improve the other Muslim. You should do Islam with him. You should correct him. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin khrijat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us Muslims as a khaira ummah, the best of people evolved for mankind. And Allah continues, He's calling us the best of people because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we are unfit to be called as khaira ummah. We are unfit to be called as Muslims. So it's the duty of every Muslim that he should do isla and dawa and try and improve his fellow Muslim. And there's a hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, in the book of faith, hadith number 79, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that if any of the Muslims see anything which is abominable, anything which is wrong, he should stop it with his hand. 
if it does not have the strength to do that, you should stop it with his tongue. If he does not have the strength to do that, then you should at least abhor it in his heart. You should at least curse in his heart. And then he will have the least degree of faith. That means if you abhor it in your heart, if you curse in your heart, you are the lowest level of mu'min. That is the reason Isra is a very important part of the Muslim's life. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. In terms of topic today, of course, it's Ramadan, the issue of Ramadan. Why is Ramadan the preferred month of undergoing the process of self-improvement and Islam? Ramadan is the best month of self-improvement as well as Islam because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu, O you believe, kutiba alaykum as -sayam. Fasting has been prescribed to you. Kama kutiba alal lazina amin kablikum. As it was prescribed to people who came before you. Lallakum tatakun. So that you may learn self restraint So if you fast, the main reason is to learn self restraint Taqwa, righteousness, piety, God consciousness. And as we discussed earlier, that the psychology they tell us, that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So in the month of fasting, when we fast, Inshallah, whatever deficiencies we have, it is the best opportunity to control them. Because if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So all your desires which may be away from Islam, away from Allah and His Rasul's commandments, this is the best opportunity. Therefore, Ramadan is the month of self-improvement and Islam. Same way when we are doing Islam, correcting another Muslim, who is also fasting, it is the best time that he can agree with the improvement and best time to correct himself. Furthermore, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, volume number 2, page number 230, hadith number 7148, where the beloved Prophet said that Ramadan is the month in which the gates of heaven, they are opened. And the gates of hell, they are closed. And the devils, they are chained. So when the devils are chained, there are less chances that you can be distracted. And there are more chances that you can go on the straight path. There are less temptation from the devil. So that is the reason it is the best time in the full year for a person to islah and for a person to improve himself, both. This is the time where he can be least tempted by the devil. And since the gates of heaven are open, it's inviting you towards the good. And the gates of hell are closed, so it is taking you away from the evil and the sin. And this hadith are again repeated in Sunan Nisai, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2106, that in the month of Ramadan, the gates of heaven are open, the gates of hell are closed, and the devils are chained. And it's also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 2, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1901, where the beloved Prophet said that anyone who fasts in the month of Ramadan with belief and seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all his past sins will be forgiven. So imagine this is the best opportunity. Maybe a person is a sinner. He has done many mistakes. And if he fasts the full month of Ramadan, all his past sins will be forgiven. So at least he feels like coming to the straight path. And there's a person who has sinned a lot and says, oh, I've sinned so much and now what's my chance of going to Jannah? How can I go to paradise? And how can I come on the straight path? So Ramadan is the month where all his past sins can be forgiven and he can start his life afresh. So the best time for self-improvement as well as doing Islam. Same with the other Muslim brother. Well, Dr. Zakir, it seems like you've explained that Ramadan is indeed uh, 30 days of training. And for us to um, implement some good habits into our life if we have been falling into error. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us all to take the use of that opportunity and really sock home some excellent deeds for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah. Um, I mean. Could you at this stage just explain to us could you define what exactly is a major sin? Major sins are those actions and deeds which have been forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and which have been prohibited by Muhammad 
in the Sunnah, in the authentic Hadith, and which has also been clarified by the first generation of people around the Prophet, that the Sahabas. So if it's prohibited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and by the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called as a major sin. And it is mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Mustadak al Khaki, volume number two, in the book of Tafsir, Hadith number 3419, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, you have to abstain from it. And whatever He has permitted, you can indulge in that. And in things which Allah is silent, that's a concession for you. So take the concession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets. And the messenger recited the verse of the Quran of Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 64, which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets. And it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number 2766, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, that do you know which are the seven destructive sins? So the Prophet said that they are, number one, associating partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or associating in worship anyone else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, practicing sorcery, that's black magic. Number three, taking the life of a person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sacred, unless for a just cause. And he further goes and says that eating riba, interest and usury. Eating the orphan's property unlawfully, unjustly. Then he continues and says that showing your back to the enemy, fleeing away from the battlefield. And the seventh one, that slandering chaste women who are just believers. So these are the seven obnoxious sins mentioned by beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked, it's mentioned in the commentary of At-Tabri, volume number four, hadith number 9207, that Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked, that our major sin seven, Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, reply, 70 is a closer number than to seven. So these seven sins mentioned by the beloved Prophet, they are just giving outlines of which categories of sins are. That doesn't mean there are seven sins. There are many more. It gives the outline that sins related to shirk, sins which have a penalty, whether it be fornication, whether it be practicing black magic, whether it be theft. He is giving a sample. But according to Ibn Abbas, he says that 70 were the major sins. Well, thank you for the answer, Dr. Zakia. Can I burden you by asking you now to list exhaustively the 70 major sins in Islam. Is that possible? I'll try, inshallah. As I mentioned to you that according to the hadith of Ibn Abbas, which is mentioned in At-Tabri, point number four, hadith number 9207, that Ibn Abbas, the thing was asked, that are the major sins seven, and he replied that 70 is a closer number than seven. Imam Adhabi, May Allah have mercy on him. He has written a book, Al-Qabair, The Major Sins, and he has listed the 70 major sins from Quran and Hadith according to his understanding. There is no Quranic verse which says that these are the 70 major sins. Neither is there any Sahih Hadith which says that these are the 70 major sins. But Imam Al-Dhabi, may Allah have mercy on him, he has compiled according to his understanding from the Quran and Hadith the 70 major sins according to his order. Some people agree, some people disagree. It's a different thing. But since Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the 70 sins, Imam Adhabi, may Allah have mercy on him, he has listed the 70 sins according to his understanding as follows. Number one according to him is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ascribing any partners, joining anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's in worship. Number two is murder. Number three is practicing sorcery or black magic. Number four is not praying. Number five is not giving zakat by a person who has a wealth above the nisab level or equivalent to nisab level. Number six 
a person not fasting in the month of Ramadan without a valid reason. Number seven, a person not performing Hajj if he is able to do it. If he has the means and if health permits him and does not do Hajj, it is the seventh major sin. The eighth major sin is disrespect to parents. Ninth is abandoning the relatives. Tenth major sin is adultery and fornication. Eleventh is homosexuality and sodomy. Twelfth is eating rabba, taking and giving of rabba, that's interest and usury. Anyone who involves in rabba, he's doing a major sin. Thirteenth is eating up the orphan's property unlawfully. Fourteenth is lying against Allah and his messenger. Number fifteenth is turning your back to the enemy, running away from the battlefield when the enemy is there. Sixteenth is a leader who deceives these people and is unjust towards his people. Seventeenth is being proud and arrogant. Eighteenth is giving a false witness. Nineteenth is having intoxicants, drinking wine, alcohol, drugs, etc., any khamar, any intoxicants. Twentieth is gambling. Twenty-first is slandering a chaste woman. Twenty-second is stealing from the spoils of war. Twenty-third is stealing. Twenty-fourth is highway robbery. Twenty-fifth is taking a false oath. Twenty-sixth is oppression. Twenty-seventh is illegal gain. Twenty-eighth is consuming wealth which has been acquired unjustly. Twenty-ninth is suicide. Thirtieth is frequently lying. Thirty-first is judging unjustly. Thirty-second is giving and taking of bribe. Thirty-third is a woman imitating a man and a man imitating a woman. Thirty-fourth is being cuckold, that is, a husband of an adulteress. Thirty-five is marrying a divorced woman in order to make her lawful for her previous husband. Thirty-sixth is not being careful about one's urine, to see to it that it doesn't spill on the body, etc. Not being careful about one's own urine. Thirty-seventh is showing off. Thirty-eighth is acquiring knowledge of the religion for the worldly reason and conceiving this knowledge. Thirty-ninth is betrayal of trust. Fortieth is recounting of favors. Forty-first is denying Allah's decree. Forty-second is listening to other people's private conversation. Forty-third is carrying tales. Forty-fourth is cursing. Forty-fifth is breaking of contracts. Forty-sixth is believing in fortune telling and the astrologers. Forty-seventh is a woman who has bad conduct towards the husband. Forty-eighth is making statues and making paintings. Forty-ninth is lamenting, wailing and tearing one's clothes or doing such acts when any calamity befalls him or her. Fiftieth is being unjust to others. Fifty-first is overbearing to one's wife or to one's servant or to the poor or to the animals. Fifty-second is offending one's neighbor. Fifty-third is offending and abusing the Muslims. Fifty-fourth is offending the other people and being arrogant towards them. Fifty-fifth of the major sin according to Imam al-Dhabi is trailing your garment below the ankle in pride. Fifty-sixth is wearing of gold and silver for the men. Fifty-seventh is a slave running away from the master. Fifty-eight is sorting an animal who has been ascribed to someone else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fifty-nine is ascribing one's paternity to a father who does not belong to himself or to herself. Sixtieth is arguing and disputing violently. Sixty-first is holding of excessive water. Sixty-second is shortage in weight and measure. Sixty-third is feeling secured from 
Allah's plan. 64th is offending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's righteous friends. 65th is not praying in a congregation and praying alone without a valid reason. 66th is missing Juma Salah persistently without any valid excuse. 67, usurping the rights of the, her through bequest. 68, deceiving and plotting. 69, spying for the enemy of the Muslims. And 70th of the major sin is cursing and insulting the companions of the Prophet. So these were the 70 major sins that have been listed by Imam al dhabi in his book al qabair that is the major sins, based on the hadith, based on the call of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that there are 70 major sins. This is his listing, his order, but naturally based on his understanding of the Quran and Sahih Hadith. There are scholars who do differ whether the major sins are 7 or they are 17 or they are 35 or they are 70. Some of the people may disagree that some should not be in the major sins, they should be in the minor sins. Some may say that this is not a sin at all. So scholars do differ, but on the whole, Imam Adhabi, mashallah, may Allah have mercy on him, is a great scholar. And this is the way how he has listed these, but there is a difference of opinion in it. Okay, well, Jazakallah khair for that, and uh, at the end of that round, you scored 95%. <laughs> well, Dr. Zakia, for the benefit of the viewers that have listened to the 70 major sins that you've listed, could you explain what is the reward that a person will get from abstaining from those major sins in this life? Allah Subhanahu says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 31, that if anyone eschews from the most heinous of the things which are forbidden to do, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expel out of you the evil in you and will make you enter the gate of honor. That means if you abstain from the major sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take away all the other small, small sins and he will make you enter paradise. Allah repeats the message. In Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 37, where Allah says that if you abstain from the major sins and the shameful deeds, and those who, when they get angry, yet they forgive. Talking about these people, those who go to Jannah. It's further mentioned in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 32, that if you abstain from the heinous sins, from the major sins and the shameful deeds, getting involved or indulging in small faults, in small sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is off forgiving and most merciful. That means as long as you abstain from the major sins and even if you do these small faults and small sins, inshallah Allah will forgive you and you shall enter Jannah. And the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned say Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 450, which says that the five daily prayers and from one Friday prayer to the next Friday prayer and one Ramadan to the next Ramadan, it is the period for expiation of your sins as long as you abstain from major sins. That means if you abstain from major sins, the five times that you offer Salah, one Friday Salah to the other Friday Salah, one Ramadan to the other Ramadan, all your sins will be forgiven as long as you abstain from the major sins. So if you abstain from major sins, inshallah you shall enter Jannah. MashaAllah, <laughs> that's a very good reason to abstain over the remaining part of this program and the following program, inshallah, we will be discussing some of those major sins, although we haven't got time to discuss all 70, and obviously offering some ways to avoid committing them repeatedly. Could you explain, Doctor, what is the most deadly major sin of all major sins? The number one major sin or the deadliest of all the major sins is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is shirk. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveth not if anyone associate partners with him. If Allah pleases, he may forgive anything else. Allah repeated the message in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveth not the sin of joining other gods with Allah. 
any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who has joined God with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has strayed away far. And there are various say hadith mentioning that the biggest of all the major sins is shirk. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 9, hadith number 6871, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi said, the most major biggest sin is joining God with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's further repeated in several Sahih hadith, including Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, Hadith number 2654, where the beloved Prophet asks the Saba that do you know which is the biggest of all the major sins? So the Saba has replied, Allah's Messenger knows the best. So Allah's Messenger replied that joining God with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Joining in worship, somebody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are several verses in the Quran which also give the same message that shirk is one of the most deadliest. It is the deadly sin. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, Inno me shrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, faqad harramma allahu alayhul jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him, paradise forbidden for him, wama wahu nar, wama wahu zolimini ansar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. Allah says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 13, join not in worship with Allah any other God. Join not in worship other gods with Allah. For anyone who does false worship, it is the highest of the wrongdoing. That means the biggest sin in Islam, it is shirk, associating partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's Messenger further says in Sahih Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 7114, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I I am alone self-sufficient and do not require any associate. And anyone who does any deed for someone else, as well as for myself, I renounce that deed for the person who he has associated. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require any associate. He alone is self-sufficient. Therefore, shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. Well, Jazakallah khair for the answer, Dr. Zakir. And I'd further like to say that we do see a lot of this sin being committed amongst the other non-Muslim communities. Is it true to say that Muslims are free from committing this sin or do they commit this sin as well? Unfortunately, besides the non-Muslims, there are many Muslims who also commit the shirk, this deadliest of all the major sins. And many a time, many Muslims they call upon people other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They ask them for the ultimate help. You know, they seek the ultimate help from people other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They pray to people other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah clearly mentioned in the Quran and tells the people to abstain doing such things. Allah says in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number five, Ya qina budwa ya qina stain. They alone we worship, they alone we ask for help. Allah says in Surah Ghafir, Chapter number 40, verse number 60. Ask me and I will answer your prayer. Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23, that the Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 194, that all those who you worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are like servants like unto you. That means they are like normal, they are like servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like we are servants. Even those who you call besides Allah, even they are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many verses in the Quran guiding us that we should not ask for the ultimate help or pray to anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Aqaf, chapter number 46, verse number 5, that indeed they have strayed away those who call to other than Allah. And these people, they will not be able to answer on the day of judgment. And neither do they hear their call and their prayer. Allah says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 73, that all those who you call upon, all those who you worship, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if all of them gather together, they will not be able to even create a fly. Leave aside, create a human being and help them. They cannot even create a fly. And if the fly snatches away some food, they will not even be able to get it back. 
people are those who petition people are those to whom they petition and allah's messenger for the says in sahih bukhari volume number 6 hadith number 4497 allah's messenger says that anyone who dies invoking to anyone besides allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and does not repent before dying then he will be entered into hell fire he will surely go to hell if anyone who does shirk and dies as a mushrik he will go to hell fire so this is a sin which many muslims unfortunately they indulge in this thing and the other common thing which leads to shirk is if you slaughter anything in name of anyone besides allah even this is indirectly shirk and many of the muslims they unfortunately indulge in this practice which leads to shirk like some muslims when they buy a new house they want to slaughter an animal in the name of a jinn you know the jinn may have possessed it to please the jinn or if they want to dig a well they slaughter in the name of a jinn and they do such practices which are alien to islam and allah says in the quran in no less than four different places in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 173 in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 3 in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 145 and in surah nahl chapter number 16 verse number 115 hurmat alaykum al maytutu wa dam wa lahm al khinzir wa ma uhilla li ghair allah bi for bin for you for food ah dead meat blood the flesh of swine and any food on which any name besides allah's name is taken so if you have any food on which any name besides allah's name is taken it is equivalent to shirk it is haram even if you slaughter any animal in the name of anyone besides allah it is a shirk it is prohibited in islam allah says in surah imran chapter number 3 Verse number 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to put our full trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only him and no one else. And Allah says in Surah Qawsar, chapter number 108, verse number 2. Fasalli liyabbika vanhar. That turn to the Lord in prayer and sacrifice. Sacrifice is only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And prayer is only due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, hadith number 4878, where the beloved Prophet said that Allah curses the one who sacrifices in the name of anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So unfortunately, some of the Muslims indirectly get involved in this major sin, which is the biggest sin in Islam, that is shirk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this month the month of correction as we're talking about Islam. And this is the best month where if we are involving any of the sins any of the major sins or minor sins we can correct ourselves and if our muslim brother is doing the same we can we slaughter to him because the shayateen they are chained so the best time that they can accept the message there will be less diversion from the truth and the khutwa to shaitan is less and because of fasting our taqwa is at the highest level so may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us i mean i mean especially in this month of course dr zakir In your list earlier on you mentioned that the unlawful killing of innocent people is one of the major sins. Now unfortunately the media often portrays the Muslims as promoting the killing of innocent human beings. Could you just clarify exactly what is the Islamic perspective on this killing of innocent human lives? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentions in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 32 that if anyone kills any other human being unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity the quran is very specific if anyone whether muslim or non muslim kills any other human being whether muslim or non muslim unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity So killing any innocent human being is prohibited in Islam. So what the media portrays that Islam promotes killing innocent human being at etc terrorism is totally a misconception. And most of the religions they do say that killing innocent human being is wrong, but Islam goes a step further and continues in the same verse in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 32. Continues and says that if anyone saves any human being it is as though he has saved the whole nation. That means if you save one human life, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. So Islam not only condemns killing innocent human beings, 
it promotes saving the life of human beings. Allah further says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that take not life which Allah has made sacred, unless by way of justice or law. That means killing as mentioned of a human being, you can't kill an innocent human being, but if a human being commits murder, but natural, it doesn't mean that anyone can go and take revenge or can retaliate and kill the murderer. Or if someone is spreading corruption, you can go and kill him. You have to take him to the law. And if it's an Islamic country, take him to a court of Islamic law, take him to the Qadi, and then he will pronounce the judgment that if he deserves to be killed, he'll be put to death. But that doesn't mean that any Muslim can take the law in his own hand. He should go to the Islamic court of law, if it's an Islamic country, or to the law of that country. And in general, as I mentioned, killing any innocent human being, it is prohibited. And that's what is mentioned by our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 9, hadith number 6871. The Prophet said, the biggest of the major sins are, first, associating partner with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Number two, is taking a life or murdering or killing any innocent human being. So generally, you cannot kill any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. There are many other verses which say specifically that you should not kill Muslims also. General verses, not killing any innocent human being. There are specific verses which say that you should not kill Muslims. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 93, that if anyone intentionally kills a believer, he will be in hellfire forever to abide therein forever. And Allah's curse and wrath will be on him. And he will get a dreadful penalty for killing any believer unless for the cause that is mentioned, unless he commits murder or corruption, killing is prohibited. It's further mentioned in the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the Book of Faith, hadith number 31. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if two believers fight amongst themselves with swords, and if one believer kills the other believer, both the murderer and the murdered person, they will go to hell. So the Sahaba asked the Prophet that we can understand that the murderer goes to hell. Why does the murdered believer goes to hell? So the Prophet said that the murdered person also had the intention to kill the believer. That's the reason both will go to hell. And it's further mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 9, hadith number 6862, the beloved Prophet said that a believer is at liberty and free until he unlawfully takes the life of another human being. That means taking the life of any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, is prohibited and condemned in Islam. It is one of the biggest major sins. It comes number two in the 70 major sins. May Allah protect us from making such an error in our lives, inshallah. So for the uh, benefit of the viewers, Dr. Zakir, could you explain why the practice of black magic is prohibited and is one of the major sins in Islam? In Islam, black magic is kufr. It is kufr in Islam. And it has been labeled as one of the major sins in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number 2766, where the beloved prophet said that the seven most destructive sins are, and the first he said that joining God with Allah, that is shirk. Number two is murder. Number three is practicing black magic, that's sorcery. So Muhammad the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has labeled black magic, practicing sorcery as one of the major sins in Islam. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 102, that they learn things which harm, not which brings profit to others. So it only, this black magic only brings harm and does not bring gain or profit to anyone. It's mentioned in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 64, which says that however much the magicians, however much skills they have, they will never be successful. Success will never be there 
how was skillful there? And it's further mentioned in Surah Baqarah chapter number two, verse number 102, that Suleiman alayhi salam did not disbelieve. It is the shayateen, it is the devils who disbelieved because they practiced black magic and other things which were sent on the city of Babylon to the two angels, Harut and Marut. But these two angels, they never did kufr, they never disbelieved. And they never practiced black magic, but they always told the people that we have been sent as a trial, as a test. So do not disbelieve and do not practice the black magic. So black magic is kufr in Islam. And the punishment for a person who practices black magic is death penalty. But unfortunately, there are many Muslims who indulge in black magic. Many of the Muslims, they go to a person who does black magic in order to take revenge from someone, in order to hurt enemy, which is totally haram in Islam, it's totally prohibited. Unfortunately, some of our Muslims, when black magic is done on them, they go to the magicians, asking them to save them from the black magic. The best person to seek protection is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Mu'azatain, the last two surahs of the Quran, surah number 113, that is Surah Falak, and surah number 114, that is Surah Nas, where we say, Kula Uzbira bin Falak, say, seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak, or Kula Uzbira bin Nas, say, seek refuge with the Lord of dawn. And it says in Surah Falak that they seek refuge from the people who practice black magic. And Surah Nas, chapter 114, from those who whisper and withdraw. So these two surahs were specifically revealed as a relief, as a protection from black magic. So black magic is one of the major sins in Islam. And indulging it directly and indirectly is private in Islam. Jazakallah. Dr. Zakir, last question today. Last but not least. What does Islam say about the respect given to parents? As we mentioned, that disrespect to parents is number eight in the 70 major sins in Islam according to Imam al dhahabi And it's very sinful to respect parents. Therefore, there are various verses in the Quran and the Hadith which show emphasis on respecting the parents. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, Allah says that we have ordained that you worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you be kind to your parents. And if one of them or both of them reach old age, don't say a word of contempt to them. Don't say oof to them. But address them with honor. And lower to them your wing of humility. And pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherish me in childhood. That means if your parents reach old age, one of them or both of them, you can't even say oof to them. Further, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that Allah says, be good to your parents. And he says in several verses in the Quran, especially your mother, Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Allah says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to their parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was the weaning. Allah says in Surah Al-Kaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In pain did the mother bore you, and in pain did she give you birth. So here, Allah says respect your parents, especially the mother. And there are various hadith talking about respecting the mother. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Adab. Book of Manners, chapter number two, hadith number 5971. A person comes to the Prophet Muhammad and asks him that who deserves the best companionship in this world? The Prophet says, your mother. The man asks, after that who? The Prophet repeats, your mother. The man asked, after that who? Again, the Prophet says for the third time, your mother. The man asked, after that who? Then the Prophet says, your father. That means 75%, three-fourth of the companionship goes to the mother, 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, and she gets the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. So these are the teachings in Islam as far as respect to parents are concerned, 
and a mother gets three times more companionship, thrice more companionship than the father. It's further mentioned in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, hadith number 3004. A man came to the Prophet and sought his permission to go to jihad, that is firing the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the battlefield. The Prophet asked him, that, do you have parents? He said, yes. So he said that you go and serve your parents, showing the importance that serving parents and being dutiful towards one's parents is more important than going for jihad, fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your parents require you, it's more important to serve your parents than to go for jihad, fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same message is given in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Adab, hadith number 5970, that a person asked that, which deed is dearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the Prophet said that offering the five prescribed prayers at the earliest time. The man asked, after that, which is the dearest deed? The Prophet said, being dutiful towards your parents. The man asked, after that, which? The Prophet said that fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing jihad. So here we realize that after offering prayers at the prescribed time, at the earliest time, the next thing Allah likes is being dutiful towards your parents, respecting your parents, being obedient to your parents. And then comes the jihad the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, hadith number 5372. The Prophet said, the three types of people we were deprived from going to paradise. The first is one who drinks intoxicants. Number two, one who is disobedient to the parents. And number three, one who does shameful deeds on behalf of the family. So all these three people were deprived paradise. So therefore, disrespecting the parents is one of the major sins in Islam. Jazakallah khair once again, Dr. Zakir Naik, for your answers today. I think we've got plenty of ammunition to give the brothers and sisters, the viewers at home, some food for thought about what to do in the next 10 days or so. Inshallah, pass that message on to as many brothers and sisters that are not watching Peace TV today. Jazakallah khair. Brothers and sisters, as I've said, plenty of ammunition, plenty of advice, and plenty of good advice at that from Dr. Zakir today on the topic self-improvement in the month of Ramadan and Islah. So please, brothers and sisters, do take heed and act upon the advice. You've got at least another 10 days, but you've got your whole life, inshallah, ahead of you to implement these beautiful gems of Islam that Dr. Zakia has given you today and will continue to give you over the next 10 days of Ramadan, inshallah. And tomorrow, brothers and sisters, do join us at the same time tomorrow when we'll be discussing the second part of Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حافظين ذاكرين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صبر وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورفق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوحيد